Good morning, Maidy McGarvey. Welcome on VH Berries. Hi, thanks for having me. Tell me those bad jokes that you like so much. <laughs> oh man, I'm more like hearing them and appreciating them than telling them. <laughs> so I don't know if I have any on the spot to tell you. <laughs> That's okay. For years, uh, I saw your photograph in American newspapers and magazines, uh, not knowing it was you all along. A great mm -hmm. example is the Time uh, magazine cover. I am a teacher in America. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I work in Ohio and um, I, I live close to a lot of different states, like in the Midwest. I'm always traveling to Kentucky and Indiana and Michigan, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. Um, and just kind of cover Appalachia and the Rust Belt in the Midwest. Um, and then, yeah, the Time Magazine cover was actually in Kentucky um, and they were looking at teachers in America and basically how they, you know, have to sort of scrape by to make it um, just because they're paid so little. So the teacher that I followed, um, she donates or I guess sells her blood plasma Um, she has a second job in security at like an arena that she goes to right after school. Um, and she, you know, she has 16 years of experience and a master's degree. So, um, that was a really interesting story to work on just to kind of see what teachers have to go through to make ends meet and, and how, um, sort of undervalued their jobs are here in America. Um, you know, I personally think that teachers should be getting paid top dollar because of what they have to go through every day and, and the responsibility of like teaching the youth. And, you know, the teachers are often so much more than teachers. They're, um, you know, they can be social workers, they can be uh, like a second parent to kids. So it was just an interesting experience um, sort of shadowing this one teacher. And then um, it ended up being on the cover of Time Magazine, which was really crazy. I had no idea I was going to be like a cover story. So I just sort of woke up to an email from my editor with the um, tear sheet that had, you know, my picture on the cover. So it was just, it was a really surreal moment in my career. And um, I was happy that her story was getting so much attention. And, you know, personally, it was just really exciting to kind of reach that milestone of like having a Time Magazine cover. So, Maidy McGarvey, you took this picture. It has been on the Time magazine cover on the front page. Uh, so it had a huge impact on uh, this uh, very special topic in society. Do you have any news of this very special teacher? You know, I haven't talked to her in a little while, but um, I do remember seeing on uh, social media that she had like printed out the cover really, really big. <laughs> and um, I think the local news did like a story about how she made the cover. And, um, you know, I don't know sometimes if people realize like how much like attention their story is going to get. But I think that she I mean, she was very vocal about like how she felt about um, you know, teachers being undervalued. So I think that, I think she was really happy to have the, the exposure, um, to kind of shed more light on, on what teachers in America are going through. You just mentioned it earlier. You are working in the Midwestern United States and you are based in, uh, Pinkle, uh, Rington, Ohio. I'm sure you didn't choose this location because it's on the same time zone as New York. It has to be other reasons. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I live in Columbus, Ohio, and um, I, I really think it's important to... You know, I, I, I live, I've lived in Ohio since I was like 12 years old. Um, and I've left, I, I worked in San Francisco for a little bit. I lived in uh, Vermont for a year and worked at a newspaper there. But, you know, Ohio is really home to me at this point in my life. And, um, you know, having grown up here and, and really getting to know the community, um, I think it's really important that people, have a connection with their community and have a connection with the place that they, you know, might be from or live from. And, you know, so I think that photographers live in New York and, and DC and, and all that are amazing and it's great. Um, I just think that there needs to be photographers that live like anywhere else in the country, um, to cover the stories in their own backyard. So I'm really passionate about, um, 
just sort of like photographing my backyard and really getting to know people in this community and in this region um, and working on stories that are really important um, to me because I live here and also to my community and um, hopefully being sort of like a, a trusted source for them. And your journey from your backyard uh, to become one of the finest photographer in America has more than a decade of struggle um, before finding any kind of success. Where did you start from? So, yeah, I went to Ohio University for college and I studied photojournalism. Um, and I, I graduated not really knowing what my direction was going to be or what I was going to do. Um, and then I got a job offer in Burlington, Vermont. So I moved to Vermont not knowing a soul, you know, just packing up my little car and moving there like right before the dead of winter <laughs> in Vermont, which was pretty intense. Um, and, and I worked in, you know, at this newspaper for a year and really, you know, it was a grind. I had to shoot like four or five assignments a day and I was doing like video and just sort of, you know, it was, it was a whole year of just grinding and hustling. Um, and then after a year I got laid off from the job. Um, unfortunately a lot of newspapers are just shrinking. Um, so that's when I decided to come back to Ohio to, um, take, you know, sort of a stab at freelancing. And, you know, I tell people this all the time that like the first couple years of freelancing, I was just pretty much unemployed. I mean, I was shooting maybe an assignment or two a month or, you know, there was months where I was not shooting at all. Um, and it was very discouraging, you know, in the beginning because I had such high ambitions and I really like wanted to do this professionally and, and be, you know, good at it and, and get to know my community and, and get to work for these clients that I always dreamed of. Um, and, it really, you know, doesn't happen overnight. I don't think that many people are overnight successes. I think that it really takes years of persistence and um, hard work and grinding and getting to know people and just kind of not giving up. Um, that's sort of what it is. So, you know, I, I have friends who, you know, they have projects that they, they do and, and stories that they photograph that really put them on the map. And, you know, people are like, oh my gosh, you're just, you're like an overnight success. And they're like, no, this is, this is 10 years in the making of, of a lot of hard work and, and not giving up. So, um, you know, I have to say to people who want to get into this career or students who might be in the same place or people trying to, you know, um, start freelancing and it's, it's just really slow and it's not really picking up, you know, just, the just being persistent and knowing that like you are a good storyteller and there's so many stories that need to be told in your backyard and if you just sort of stay with it and don't give up and um you know keep your passion alive and um you know I, I took a lot of work in the beginning that like you know I was doing shooting weddings or events or um you know like you know, stuff I really didn't want to do, but just to pay the bills and then working on these stories that I really cared about in my free time. And, um, I think that sort of persistence and, um, just not giving up on it led to, you know, having a career, successful career now, um, you know, 10 years after I graduated from college, you know, so I like to look back and reflect a little bit and be like, okay, you know, I remember how, how discouraged I was in the beginning and just being proud that I never really gave up on it. And, you know, uh, fortunate now that I have the career that I do. And Maidy McGarvey, in addition to this, uh, few months of, of, um, of blank space where you didn't had any, any work to do. You often talk about the fact of, of being a woman in a more male uh, dominated uh, field of journalism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think there have been some good strides to, um, you know, kind of diversify the field and, and, um, give more opportunities and assignments and, and, um, you know, attention to women and photographers of color. And, and that's really amazing thing to see happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, especially when I first started, like there were just not many women, um, doing this professionally. I mean, there, there are so many, 
amazing women who really like paved the way for, for people like me who um, were kind of the trailblazers of, of this industry and, you know, worked in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s when it was even more just kind of a boys club. And, you know, I feel very thankful looking back at them that they sort of like made the strides that they did. Um, but, you know, there's always more room for improvement. And, uh, you know, so it's just interesting to, to see, you know, the shift in the industry. Um, and just, you know, kind of making it more inclusive. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I started, you know, there, there just, wa- there weren't as many opportunities and, and, you know, 10 years later, I'm glad to see that there's more, um, but there's always more work to do. <laughs> and let's talk about um, the two words, empathy and sensitivity. Uh, I know they are a major part of any of your work today. Yeah, I mean, I that's what I strive to be as a photographer, you know, empathetic and sensitive. I, I'm always really amazed and surprised, I would say, by like how, how people open up to photographers and how many, you know, how many people in my career have really opened up their lives to me. And I'm just sort of a stranger. And on top of that, you know, I'm taking their photo, which is like, can be really intimidating and awful. Like I hate being in front of the camera. So I can only imagine like what they're feeling like where, you know, someone for is, is going to be kind of in their lives and, and taking photos of their every move and like, you know, wanting to, you know, know all about them. And, and people are so amazing and they've like, just, you know, they've opened up their lives to me and I really owe it to them to one, be able to tell their story as fully as possible because you know, it's important and I want to show like every aspect and in a really sensitive way. Um, a lot of these stories I photograph are really sensitive. They are, you know, sometimes the lowest parts of people's lives. So, you know, I, I think that empathy is the most important thing a photojournalist can strive to, to have and be, um, because these people are trusting you with their story and their lives and, and how you're going to portray them. Um, so, you know, it's so incredibly important to me to just have that respect and, and like, my goal is always to be able to, like, if they're looking at the photos and the story afterwards, be like, wow, she captured me in a really respectful way. And that's, that's me. And like, she, you know, they, they did a great job and, um, you know, I care way more about the person in the photo's opinions than anyone else's, um, cause that's what matters the most to me. You just mentioned it. These people are trusting you, Mady Mike Garvey. And there are other people that are trusting you, uh, which are politicians. Where should we start? You photographed every single politician. For example, recently, the 2020 Democratic Party uh, presidential debates. Yeah, I I covered the um, 2020 race pretty extensively. Um And really, it started way before 2020. So it was like kind of two years of my life following around all these politicians. Um, It's, yeah, covering politics is sort of like nothing else. I mean, it is chaotic. It's extremely chaotic. Um, Anyone who's like one of the bigger players, one of the bigger politicians, like um, they're they're just going to be surrounded by so many people, so many members of the media, so much security, so many people with microphones and cameras. And, you know, it's just, it's just constant chaos that surrounds them. Um, I remember being at the Iowa State Fair, uh, covering Kamala Harris. And I just have this one photo that I was like jogging to keep up and like had to climb onto a bench to photograph, but it's just her really small in the frame, but like surrounded by, I would say a hundred members of the media and spectators and all the stuff, just like in the midst of this, you know, festival. And it just, I, I like that photo because it just shows how chaotic it is. I mean, it's hard to say or see when you're kind of just like seeing a photo of them on stage talking or whatnot. Um, just, the spectacle of following around a major politician. Um, but it's, it's a really fun challenge. Um, you know, they're politicians really, I think like to, you know, they want to be shown in the way they want to be shown. So, you know, kind of the goal as a photojournalist is to get more unexpected moments, or maybe you kind of like see their personality a little bit more. Um, and it's a tough thing to do, honestly, because it's hard to one, get the access to them. And two, kind of capture that because they're, you know, career politicians know exactly what to do to like make themselves look like 
you know, the best or the most, you know, political or whatever. So um, it's it's kind of fun to look for those moments where, you know, they're just kind of like authentic and like <laughs> maybe having a moment of, uh, you know, just Zen or like collecting themselves. Um, I always like that. And I also think that like politicians, like their supporters are just as interesting as them. So sometimes when I'm, you know, photographing um, a politician on the trail, like they're, you know, they're on the stage for 30, 40 minutes and it's kind of like the same photo after a while. So you, you get them like talking on, you know, the podium, but I'm also, I'm so much more curious often, like, how, like, what are your supporters like, you know, people are crying and just like looking at them with so much hope. And it's like, that's more interesting than, than, you know, even a picture of a politician, I think, because these, you know, it's, it's made up of, of the American population and, and what, you know, each one of their supporters thinks that this person is going to do for them and, you know, how they might change their, their lives and, and they become like, you know, emotional. And, um, so I always try to like scan the crowd and, and find those people and, and, and capture like just that feeling of like, of hope or, you know, of, of, you know, just wonder and like what's going to happen. And especially when it was such a broad field, this, this, uh, election, there was, you know, so many people running for, for president. Um, it was really, it was interesting to see like each politician had their own like, um, special you know, brand of people who kind of showed up and it was just, it was really fascinating. I, I loved it. It's really chaotic. It's a lot of like, not a lot of sleep, um, just running to, to keep up, hurry up and wait kind of stuff. But it's, it's really rewarding and it's, it's an amazing thing to see this so close, like to see history in the making in America, like under a microscope because you're right there and it's I that's what I'm so thankful for as a photojournalist is I get to be like in the front row of these like historic moments um it's just it's a really cool thing I have to admit that what I really like the most is the uh, unexpected uh, that is so hard to find. Um, it is more about the video, I have to, to say, but uh, I like the wild uh, view, uh, the raw video footage, um, uh, where we they are testing the microphone, where the m candidates are arriving, leaving, um, no zooming, you know, just a global view. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always interesting to kind of see a different side of a politician. It really is. And it's it's not the easiest thing to find. Um, but it's it's, it's a really fun challenge and <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I was just actually in DC for the inauguration. Um, so, you know, I got to I I photographed Joe Biden when he first announced his run for president in Pittsburgh in this like really, really crowded um, union hall. And then, you know, I photographed him multiple times on the, on the trail. And then I photographed him in South Carolina when he, he won the state. And that was huge. That was a huge pivot for his, his run um, as president. And then, you know, I, I got to follow him um, to the White House is him like literally walking in front of the White House during the inauguration during a pandemic where there's usually thousands of people there kind of like, you know, watching and cheering him on. And it was just, it was only media. <laughs> um, and so it was just, it was really, it was bizarre. It was, it was cool to see like his entire can see through. Um, but you know, it's just interesting to end like, during a pandemic and there's just no one there. So who, who would have thought, you know, two years ago that that's how it all ended up. But I'm really thankful to have had the opportunity. And concerning uh, the unconventional, I really uh, like the close up you made on Andrew Yang, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. See there, I, there's a few times like, so when, during the debates, um, this is obviously pre COVID, but during the presidential debates, uh, right after a lot of the candidates will come into the spin room and the spin room is just packed, packed, packed full of media members, hundreds just, and, and every time there was a politician around, they would like, there'd be someone around them that would hold up, um, a sign with their names. And then they're just like surrounded and like swarmed. Um, and, it, it, it's like the most chaotic thing in the world. Like I've seen like aides get kind of like pushed to the ground and like have to cr army crawl out, you know, so they don't get like trampled because everyone's trying to get either a quote or a photo or whatever. 
And I find that like, that is kind of where I, I would find these moments of these politicians just sort of like closing their eyes and like trying to get like a moment of like Zen to themselves <laughs> because it is just so chaotic. It's so crazy. And so I have, you know, a few photos of like Andrew Yang or um, Kirsten Gillibrand or Amy Klobuchar, you know, just kind of like taking a moment to like breathe like right before the cameras start rolling and it's i i like looking back at those because i can remember how chaotic it is and i can remember how just insane the room is and how it felt and and i can only imagine how they feel when they're they're the center of attention and everyone wants to get a photo or get a quote and they just have to kind of keep it together because politicians really can't flounder you know they can't really mess stuff up and uh the pressure just must be insane so um I do like the kind of the moments I, I capture of them just like breathing and like being like, okay, get it together. And then we're going to go on air. So, um, you know, that's kind of speaks to what I was talking about before, like finding sort of those like unscripted moments with politicians are kind of a fun challenge. I would love to focus on two special events uh, because you just mentioned it at the end of January. Uh, you were there for CNN uh, for the inauguration of Joe Biden and Month before, you followed Kamala Harris through a bus tour um, with the New York Times. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> both, both of those were really amazing experiences. <laughs> um, yeah, so with Kamala, um, I yeah, I was on a, a one week ish tour of um, her through Iowa because Iowa is the first state to um, vote with their caucus um, in the primary. So it's this really important state for politicians, and they all go there to campaign for months, like six months. It's, it's kind of insane how much time they spend in Iowa. Um, so I, I had the opportunity to follow her for the New York times, um, as she, you know, did one of these, these campaign trails. And, um, so it's a lot of usually like the politician is on their separate bus and then the media follows them in the media bus. Um, but I got the opportunity to ride on the bus with her and take photos for maybe like 45 minutes or so. Um, but it was amazing. It was like, I, I, the access was great. Like it was, it was nice to see her working. Like anytime I can get like a little bit more of a, um, like a peek into their lives, like off stage, any politician running for president or in general, it just, it, it I think it, it like lets the viewer get a better idea of who they are. Um, you know, not so scripted, not so like, you know, perfect, um, And, you know, I have a few photos of her, you know, talking with her staff. And then I remember her riding the bus and just sort of like looking out the window and like, again, having a moment to kind of breathe because it's it's so chaotic. I cannot imagine what it's like to actually run for president because even following them as like a member of the media, it's just completely exhausting. <laughs> and like, I don't have to give a speech every night. I don't have to talk to thousands of supporters or people who don't support you and are just, you know, trying to heckle you or question you. Um, so that was, I mean, it was really cool to see like just sort of how they spend their downtime off stage. And I was really thankful that her staff um, gave me the opportunity to do that. And then otherwise we just sort of followed her around as she talked at different um, places like high schools or uh, restaurants or whatnot. Um, and then a couple times there would be these like off the record moments where they just sort of like pull up to a different, like a random restaurant. And, you know, you can kind of get these like really authentic uh, reactions of people being like, oh, wait, is that, is that a presidential candidate that just walked into this <laughs> place? Um, so it's really fun to see people's reactions there. So yeah, it was great. That was an amazing experience. I really, I loved that time and it was really cool to see, um, you know, just people on the trail and how they respond to her. And especially like as a, as a woman candidate and woman of color, just how that really affected people, um, and gave, you know, some people like some of her supporters, a lot of hope. Um, and then, yeah, again, I, I got to be there, um, at the inauguration for CNN at the end of, you know, in, in January, this January. And, Watching her and Joe Biden walk into the White House was a cool moment for me just as a photojournalist, like seeing them campaign throughout the year and then like kind of seeing it all come to a head as they're literally walking into the White House for the first time. It was just a really neat moment. Um, so again, like I just feel really thankful I get to document history like this. And, you know, obviously she's the first woman vice president and 
you know, a woman of color. And it's just, it was a, it was a really amazing moment just historically and, you know, as a photojournalist and since I had been following all of them for so long. Um, so yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> Please, Maidy McGarvey, do not underestimate your skills because the inauguration days has uh, been your longest day of uh, ever because uh, <laughs> you had to be prepared. Um, you had to work up super early. Uh, I suppose it was super stressful. Yeah, I mean, it's those kinds of events are honestly <laughs> like it's honestly like 85% logistics and maybe 15% actually taking photos. Um, you know, we had to get there a couple days early just to like make sure all the credentials are, are in order, um, just to figure out like where we can actually like stand and like be because it's, it's really particular and especially with like security. I mean, this was after, um, what happened on January 6th at the Capitol. So security was just insane. It was, it was crazy. Like there was, you know, military vehicles every couple blocks. Um, you had to have, I mean, just so many checkpoints to get through, like anywhere close to where the politicians were going to be, where the president and vice president were going to be. Um, so I would say, honestly, like the majority of the time was figuring that stuff out. And then, um, you know, I probably only photographed for like 15 minutes total, 20 minutes total for like being there for two or three days. Um, but yeah, the day of the inauguration, I got up really, really, really early and, um, got to the White House to see, um, President Trump taking off in Marine One for his last time. Um, and, you know, we weren't sure if we'd really be able to even see it, um, what it would look like if they weren't going to really make it a thing or a spectacle. Um, so, you know, we got, I got him taking off and, um, kind of going into the, into the distance and, you know, it was really brief. And I was like, oh man, I kind of messed that shot up. And then I started to, um, like sit down on my computer to file the photos really quick. And then I was on the roof of the like media structure and every, all the other photographers kind of dispersed too. And then we see the helicopter come back and he sort of did like one more loop just to get like one other view of the White House before he left, like for the very last time. So I was like thankful I was still up on the top because I got to like capture more photos of that, which was really cool. Um, and, Yeah. And then, you know, I sort of waited around all day. And then after the inauguration, like, uh, probably nine hours later, <laughs> um, from the time I got there, maybe, you know, maybe more than that. Um, that's when, uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, um, kind of came down the parade routes in front of the White House. And it's kind of a lot of pressure because, you know, you're waiting around all day. You're trying to figure out the best place to like, sit or stand to get the photo you need. And, and there's only certain places that you're allowed to go. And then you really, you can't mess it up because, <laughs> you know, it's so brief. It's over in like 30 seconds. Like they walk down the street and then it's done. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a lot of pressure, um, just not to mess it up, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it was great. Like it was awesome. I, I kind of wish I was in like a slightly different place. Um, you know, when Biden was walking down the street, but like it was, It was amazing. It was amazing to see it, you know, got photos. I got Kamala like right in front of the White House and I got to work like shoulder to shoulder with a lot of my really good friends. And it was, it was cool to see, you know, some of them, um, I hadn't seen in a long time because no one's really been seeing each other with COVID and, um, just to work like side by side, heavily masked, <laughs> um, with some of my like, you know, photo heroes. It was really, it was a cool experience. And do you actually remember the lunch you ate this special day? The what? I, the what? The lunch. The lunch? <laughs> For like food? Um. Exactly. So, yeah, I guess, um, the, I got, you know, I was really lucky working for CNN. CNN is amazing and they really take care of their staff and um, <laughs> they had like a food trailer. So I, I don't really remember what it was. I remember being freezing. It was so cold. And, um, you know, I remember like my friends giving me uh, some hand warmers and I got to like sit in one of the CNN trailers for a little bit to warm up because it was a long day outside. But as far as food, yeah, I can't remember. It was like, <laughs> it was like soup or something. But, um, but you know, I was lucky that they had a trailer with food because otherwise like trying to find an open restaurant and like going through all the levels of security to get out of the like the perimeter would have been a nightmare so <laughs> sure and concerning the multiples uh, photographs that you took that day um 
did you send them directly after or your uh, camera is connected online? I don't know how it's work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's hard because like politics is always like they need photos like ASAP, like right away. So I, I have a um, memory card or like a uh, card reader that like connects to my phone. So I would shoot on my camera and then connect it to the card reader on my phone and then like like do a little toning and all that and then um, text it or send it right to my editor who then put it online. So I felt like that was the easiest way. And then like when there was a little bit more time and we got those initial photos of like them run walking in front of the White House or whatever, I would like scramble to my laptop and then like try to actually like um, properly like tone and caption like the rest of the photos to turn in. So it's definitely a scramble to try to get like the first photos up right away. And then, you know, after that, it's just like, okay, take a little bit more time to like look through your entire take and then sort of, you know, upload from there. Of course, uh, Mady McGarvey, because if you send all the pictures through SMS, it will be super compressed. So the newspaper, the newspaper won't be able to use it. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah, I would like drop them in like drop boxes and stuff like that's connected to my phone, but it's not a perfect system. <laughs> so I should probably figure out something better that works. But, um, you know, it all worked out for that. And Mady McGarvey, next to this work related to politics, you also done some ones related to uh, the environment. For example, two of them, uh, Koal Ash and also Dupont and uh, Chemical of Deception. Yeah, so, you know, living in Ohio, I'm really close to um, a lot of, like, factories and um, coal plants and such, and, you know, like, I, you know, I'm really close to West Virginia, so, um, for example, DuPont is, is based um, right there on, along the Ohio River, and there's a big kind of scandal and story about the the way that the, this chemical that they were using in their products um they pretty much told everyone it was safe you could eat a pound of it a day you'd be fine and then they and they were dumping it in the river and um and then all these people were getting really really sick like people in town were getting cancer um the people that worked there were getting like deathly ill a couple a woman who who was pregnant when she worked there her son was born with like severe birth defects and um you know it's just it's this really like complicated story and it's it's sort of more nuanced than you would think because it's obviously terrible but um and, and people are really upset because they are so sick at the same time there's no other like industry really around there. So if they take away the factory, they take away like, you know, the factory. And, and this could be in a lot of different towns. Then that's the entire industry. Those are people's jobs. And like, I don't, you know, a lot of people are like, it, it's a double edged sword because they're kind of poisoning the town. But if they take away the factory, there's no jobs. So, um, that was sort of the case too. So I did that one in West Virginia and then. Um, I did the story for National Geographic in Kingston, Tennessee. Um, and 10 years ago, there was this like massive coal ash spill. It was like one of the biggest man-made disasters in the country. And um, this coal ash that they usually like bury, they like the, the remnants of, of burning coal, they bury it and it just went everywhere, like all over the place 10 years ago. At this point, it's like 12 years ago. Um, and so there's all these people who were hired to clean it up. And they they kept questioning, like, is this safe? Is this okay? And then a couple of them were like, can we wear, like, face masks so we, you know, not breathing this stuff in all the time? And they were basically told, like, no. And a few of them got fired for even asking. And um, they were like, no, this is completely safe. Like, you can bathe in this stuff. Like, don't worry about it. And then 10 years later, like, 30 or 40 of the workers have died of like cancer or other ailments. And then uh, so many others are dealing with like horrible health effects, like brain cancer and like these like lesions all over their body that are just so painful and um, lung, lung cancer and like uh, just all, all kinds of stuff. They're just suffering. And um, it's just, it's just so unfair. And I, I don't know. It's just, these people are trying to make like an honest kind of like, blue collar wage um, career for themselves and lives. And, you know, 
and these like massive companies are just taking advantage of them and, and they're like dying because of it um and they think that they like didn't really want people in the town to see like the workers in hazmat suits or like all kinds of protection and then like wonder like what they're breathing in every day like living next to this coal ash pl plant um so yeah it was like basically like just to kind of save their image but in turn all these people died and um are living in like so much pain so yeah it's it's sometimes a, a challenge to like go back and and photograph something that's like sort of already happened um but you know i think through um landscapes of sort of the town and the factory and then like just spending time with the people who um are still alive and that like are just going through these like terrible health problems and like sort of seeing what their lives look like and then you know i spent time with a widow of one of the men who died and just like how much it's affected her and like how she's living her life just like so depressed every day and, and like her husband kind of died for you know she he didn't have to these were preventable deaths um so yeah it's it's something that i feel really strongly about and i've, I've worked on several stories like that um and it's unfortunately something that's really common, um, especially in this like kind of Rust Belt Appalachian part of America. America. In definitive, Mady McGarvey, if we can make a connection between um, politics and these environmental issues, a politician should definitely uh, make a tour in these places to help and change these uh, very uh, difficult situations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's the that's the hope, and um, I think a lot of politicians sometimes promise it, but it doesn't always happen. And then you know, again, it's it's sort of complicated because some people are really worried that if they do make a big change, there goes the entire industry for the town, like there goes all the jobs. So it's a really it's a hard issue. It's a really complicated topic, and. Um, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I'm curious to see what happens moving forward and 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 how we're gonna you know approach this kind of stuff. But um, it's just really it's really sad and devastating to see like the effects that it has on just individuals because I think that's like sort of like as a storyteller you hear about these like bigger topics like climate change or um, you know just something like this coal ash spill. You can like read about it. But until you like really spend time with just like an individual who's really suffering from it, um, kind of putting like a face on the issue, like I think that's the beauty of photojournalism because, you know, when you're when you're looking at something so broad, you might not connect with it as much as like looking someone dead in the eyes who has cancer or who's lost their husband to this this thing that didn't have to happen. Um, And I think that can be really the power of, of photography, um, I would hope at least, is to kind of inform people and like show that these are people suffering. They're not, it's not just like this like broad topic that you can't really like pinpoint. It's like actual families. Um, and that's, that's the thing I like, I feel like I'm good at doing and I like to do as, as a photojournalist. Um, and you know get their story out because these people desperately want their story out most of the time they want to be heard and no one's listening to them so i feel very honored that they like allow me to come into their lives in a vulnerable place and and hear their stories and tell me their stories and um you know open themselves up to me sure and more personally Mady mcgarvey this year 2021 your career has entered on another dimension what are your plans this year's yeah i mean that's a great question <laughs> um i just want to keep working on these stories that mattered to me and like my, and you know telling people's kind of like um you know just stories that others might not know that's happening so close to their home like i i just did a story for national geographic about hunger in west virginia and like how people are really suffering like they're there's they're living in either a food desert or they just don't really have the money to buy nutritional food and so you know it's something like i don't ever think twice about how i'm gonna eat in a day but this is stuff that they think about every single day all the time and this is two hours from where i live so you know i think kind of digging deeper into stories like that that could like you know 
kind of open people's eyes up to being like, this is happening in my backyard. You know, this is, this is not something that's happening like in a faraway country and, you know, it's not really relevant to me or anything. Like this is happening literally down the road and people are like struggling to eat every single day. Um, so that was a, that was a really meaningful story, um, to me. And I met just the most amazing people who opened up their lives and, and showed me what it, what it's like to be hungry in America. Cause it's, it's such an issue. Um, so I would love to work more on that story. Um, maybe in different, with different families or different communities. Um, and just kind of like, you know, anything that, that kind of opens people's eyes up to what's happening in their, in their own towns or their own backyards is, is rewarding for me. And that's kind of why I like working in a place like the Midwest or the Rust Belt or Appalachia, because there's so many of these stories. I tell other photographers this all the time, like, you don't have to go to a faraway country to tell a good story. There's, um, dozen amazing stories within a mile of you. You know, if you just look, you're going to find them. Like they're, they're everywhere. You just have to look in your backyard and, and kind of figure out what's important to you. And you really have to care about it because it's going to show if you don't really care about it in your photos. And it's not fair to people that you're asking to, um, you know, open up their lives. So yeah, I just, I, I want to keep working on stories like that. Stories that, um, you know, matter and or need to be told in my own community or, you know, the states that surround me that I work in all the time. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping this year to do more of that kind of storytelling. So your message is to open our eyes, watch around us. Thank you so much for your time. You are so inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>